everyone and a very warm welcome. My name is Victoria Beadle and I'm the CEO of Melanoma Patients Australia and your host for tonight's consumer webinar on the topic of immunotherapy and targeted therapies, systemic treatment and living well after immunotherapy. Firstly, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands and their elders, both past and present, and acknowledging the deep continuing connection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to the, to the land, the water and the sky, wherever we are on tonight here across Australia. Tonight's the second webinar in our series brought to you by Melanoma Patients Australia in partnership with Melanoma Institute Australia. Our first webinar was on brain metastases and a recording of this is now live available on the MPA and MIA websites. In the next week, our final webinar on new approaches in detecting melanoma and living well beyond a melanoma diagnosis will also be held. We'd love you to join us at that one and you can register now at melanoma.org.au slash events. I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening who are here with us. <laughs> Hopefully you can see everybody online. Um, our wonderful speakers this evening are Dr. Piers Groiver, who will be presenting first, followed by Karen Van Gorp, who will be sharing her personal story. We'll then have a panel discussion where Professor Georgina Long will also join us to answer your questions on this very important topic of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. I'd like to... Um, introduce each of our speakers while we've got them here on the screen um, and it will um, we'll, we'll just pass over to them as their sessions come up but first of all I'd like to tell you a bit more about Dr Grover. Dr Grover is a medical oncology fellow at Melanoma Institute Australia. He's completed his med medical degree with first class honours from the University of Notre Dame Fremantle in 2015. Prior to medicine Dr Grover worked as a clinical pharmacist and was the runner-up for New Zealand's Young Pharmacist of the Year in 2011. Professor Georgina Long AO is Co-Medical Director of Melanoma Institute Australia and Chair of Melanoma Medical Oncology and Translational Research at MIA and Royal North Shore Hospital, the University of Sydney. I'd like to welcome our final um, Panel is tonight and speaker Karen Van Gorb, who had an initial diagnosis of melanoma in 2011 when she discovered a melanoma on her back, which was excised. In early 2013, she discovered a lump under her right arm, and within six months, Karen's disease had progressed, unfortunately, to stage four. A lack of treatment options other than chemotherapy led Karen to research clinical trial options, and for the next two years, Karen flew fortnightly to Melbourne from Adelaide to participate in an immunotherapy clinical trial. Karen recalls during her darkest moments, um, she called Melanoma Patients Australia for support, commenting that we really understood in a way no one else did. The obvious success of the drug that was to become known as Gertruda for many patients, her response and the heartache of seeing others not being able to access it has led Karen to join the MPA team and has worked tirelessly to ensure other treatments have been successfully listed on the PBAC and advocating for patients' rights. Okay, great. Well, I would like to um, um, move now to introduce our first speaker, who um, is Dr. Grover. So we'd love to welcome Dr. Grover to the, to the screen and um, we will see our other speakers um, at the very end. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to deliver this talk on where we are with drug therapy for melanoma in 2022. My name is Dr. Piyush Grover, and I'm a medical oncology doctor at the Melanoma Institute Australia. It's an absolute privilege to work at this outstanding institution um, that is spearheading melanoma care worldwide. The intent of my talk is fourfold. Firstly, to inform, to inform you on the latest developments in melanoma management. And believe me, there are heaps. Secondly, to empower you or your loved one with some practical resources 
to better engage with melanoma care. Thirdly, to inspire you to take action against melanoma. And lastly, challenge you to join our mission of zero deaths from melanoma. And we believe we can achieve this vision. I've distilled my talk into the 10 commandments of melanoma drug therapy in 2022. But before that, I want to briefly delve into understanding the staging of melanoma. That is crucial to how we understand how melanoma is treated. So first and foremost, there are four stages to melanoma. Stage one, melanomas are thin. Stage one and stage two way melanomas are thin melanomas that are very common and treated surgically. So they're taken out surgically. Early recognition is very important. Stage 2B and stage 2C are thicker melanomas that are still confined to the skin. They're also managed with surgery. And now there is a role for medicine therapy after surgery as mop-up therapy to reduce the risk of melanoma coming back. And these developments have just happened within the last sort of few months. Stage three melanomas are either thin or thick melanomas that have spread to the nearest lymph glands or are on, the, or on their way to doing so. Surgery is still warranted where possible. And we are increasingly using medicine therapy in stage three melanomas to reduce the chances of melanoma coming back. Stage four melanomas, or sometimes stage three melanomas where surgery isn't possible, we call it unresectable stage three melanomas, is where medicine therapy is needed. Stage four melanoma is where melanoma has spread to other parts of the body. Previously thought to be not curable, treatment has come a long way. I've just with regards to stage three melanoma, while drug therapy is not currently funded in Australia for it, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. So this leads me to the 10 commandments, and I'm gonna list those 10 commandments and I'll talk about each of them. First and foremost, more than 50% of patients with advanced melanoma, so that is, patients with unresectable stage three or stage four melanoma are now cured. The point two is that immunotherapy has been an absolute game changer. Point three, targeted therapy or tablet therapy is a very important treatment option in patients with BRAF mutant or who have a BRAF mutation of their melanoma. Point four, drug therapy in stage three melanoma reduces recurrence. That is the likelihood of melanoma coming back. Five, neoadjuvant approach, and I'll explain what that is a little bit later, may become a new standard of care in stage three melanoma. Point six, we have now drug therapy for stage two melanoma and we know it works. Point seven, immunotherapy toxicity or side effects are important to recognize. Point eight, clinical trials provide new treatment options. And I'm sure Karen will tell us more about that a little bit later. Point nine, MIA's and MPA's website provides valuable patient resources. And lastly, melanoma care is multidisciplinary. So the first commandment, now more than 50% of patients with advanced melanoma can now be cured. So that includes people with stage unresectable stage three melanoma or stage four melanoma. That's also called advanced or metastatic melanoma. That is where melanoma 
has either spread to other organs from where it started, or surgery is not possible or not feasible. In that case, the point of the treatment is to reduce or even eliminate the further spread of cancer or melanoma. And in this cartoon, you can see that from where the melanoma started, it spread to other parts of the body. The type of drug therapies that we use in advanced melanoma are either targeted therapy. And as the name suggests, they're targeting the tumor directly. The other treatment option that we use is immunotherapy, where it's targeting our immune system and training our immune system to fight off the cancer. But neither of those approaches are in a way better, but they are different approaches for different situations. Now, this is a busy slide, and just give me a minute and we'll talk through it. No drug therapy talk is, is, is complete without a graph or two. So here we are talking about people with advanced melanoma. On the horizontal line, we've got months. On the vertical line, we have the number of people alive. Historically, and sadly, the five-year survival for melanoma about 10 years ago was less than 10%. It was actually 8%, which means that unfortunately only 8% of people with advanced melanoma would make to five years. With advancement in drug therapy, we are now at a five-year survival rate of more than 50%. That is remarkable. And that is something we all as a, as a society, as a community ought to be proud of. And I'm very grateful to the uh, MIA team and the team of our collaborators worldwide that have worked hard and our patients and a whole lot of people to make this happen. And in the black line is the first sort of drug that was approved, which is a type of immunotherapy called ipilimumab. The second, the green line in the curve is the one that was nivolumab. And the one which is the orange one is the combination of those two, where the survival is, is, is even higher. Some would say that immunotherapy has been an absolute game changer. And a lot of advancement in melanoma care is attributed to immunotherapy. Some would say it's even the breakthrough of the century. The way immunotherapy works, it is that it works by charging our body's own immune system to fight off cancer cells. This is a very complicated cartoon of how immunotherapy works. But essentially what it does is it hijacks the handshake that occurs between the cancer cell and the immune cell. And once it does that, it allows the immune system to recognize the cancer as bad or foreign and kill it. It's very, very clever. So I'm gonna change tax slide and move on to targeted therapy because it's not just immunotherapy that we use. Now, targeted therapy or tablet therapy is a, is a viable treatment option in people who have a particular type of melanoma that is called a BRAF mutation positive melanoma. This mutation is present in about 40% of melanomas in Australia. The, tab, the targeted therapy is given as tablet therapy and is effective in more than 90% of people. However, long-term control with the tablet or targeted therapy is achieved in about only 20% of people. Whereas immunotherapy that we saw before, when it works, we achieve a long-term control of over 50%. 
this is a, a PET scan of a patient and all the black spots were the aggressive melanoma. And after going on the tablet or targeted treatment within a few months, it seems like you, you can see it's like the cancer had all melted away. Now, how does targeted therapy compare with immunotherapy? Let's have a closer look. The targeted therapy can only be used in people wh whose melanoma carries that BRAF mutation. Immunotherapy can be used theoretically in everyone. And there's a few sort of exceptions where we have to be very cautious. Targeted therapy is given as tablet treatment, while immunotherapy is always given through a drip. Targeted therapy, the response rates, it works very well in more than 90 to 95% of people. Immunotherapy slightly lower, around 50 to 55% of people. The target therapy works quickly, usually starts working within days. Immunotherapy takes a little bit longer. It takes weeks to months to see an effect. The durability or the longevity of the response with tablet or targeted therapy is variable. It may be short in some months sometimes, and long-term control is achieved in about 20% of people. While the responses that we tend to see with immunotherapy, on the other hand, are usually long and durable, which means that once immunotherapy works, it works really well. Majority, vast majority, actually, of the side effects with uh, targeted therapy are reversible. While with immunotherapy, there are some um, permanent side effects that may occur. Now, let's change tack and talk about the drug therapy in stage three melanoma. This is melanoma that started in the skin and has spread to the nearest lymph glands. The current standard is giving drug therapy for up to a year as mop-up therapy after surgery. Let me talk through this diagram. And that approach is called adjuvant as mop-up therapy. So the black spot there is melanoma. The current best standard approach is, uh, well, is to take the melanoma out. Surgery, as you can see with the scalpel there. And then there's no melanoma that we can see in the body. But we know that sometimes there may be melanoma cells behind that one can't see. And we give drug therapy as mop-up therapy for up to a year in those sort of cases. Now, to make things more complex, there are four sub-stages to stage three melanoma. Stage three A, stage three B, C, and you guessed it, stage three D. In Australia, drug therapy or medicine therapy which could either be immunotherapy or targeted therapy, is funded by the taxpayer for all Australians with stage 3B, C, or D melanoma with certain restrictions and reduces the risk of melanoma coming back by approximately 50%. For example, with surgery alone, someone's risk of melanoma coming back may be, say, up to 60%. And by having drug therapy on top, which reduces the risk by half, it goes down to 30%. I'll mention something here, which is a little bit nuanced, which is that stage 3A melanoma is a relatively lower risk of stage 3 melanoma, and the risk-benefit assessment of drug therapy in this melanoma is still being explored, and we are currently leading uh, a worldwide review um, in, this, in this area. So 50% reduction in the risk of melanoma coming back is great, but hey, we want to do better, which is where we move on to another approach, which is the approach of giving a little bit of medicine therapy first before surgery, and that is called neoadjuvant approach. And we give drug therapy for about six to nine weeks, followed by surgery, 
And in some cases, more drug therapy may be needed, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Just last month, a game-changing trial was presented. In this trial, half the people got the standard approach, which is surgery first, followed by drug therapy. The other half of the people got nine weeks of drug therapy first and then surgery, followed by more drug therapy, but to make it up to the same amount of drug therapy in total. What they did find was that people who had drug therapy first did much better and had a lower chance of melanoma coming back. So the same cancer, the same drug, for the same duration, but just a slightly different order, and the results are remarkably different. MIA has led this approach worldwide, and we currently have multiple such trials open for patients. Why we believe that this approach is better? It's like personalized response. And a lot of people in clinic say that they love the feedback because at surgery, once the melanoma is, uh, lymph nodes are taken, we look a closer look at them and we are able to get feedback as to how well the drug therapy has worked for that particular person's melanoma. And that gives has advantages that tailors the prognosis, that tailors follow-up, and that tailors whether we need to give further mop-up therapy if needed, a second crack. There may be some theoretical disadvantages, which occurs in a very small number of people, which is if the melanoma is spreaded or has spread or is spreading before surgery, or there is a serious side effect from the drug therapy that prevents surgery. This approach is currently only available on clinical trials. Now, moving on to stage two melanoma, there were some key studies presented this year which showed that giving um, drug therapy in people with after surgery for stage 2B and stage 2C melanoma reduced the likelihood of melanoma um, coming back. And um, just last month, Professor Georgina Long presented this groundbreaking results of the uh, Checkmate 76K um, study worldwide. And I think it's worthwhile for people who've had stage 2B and stage 2C melanoma to have a discussion with a medical oncologist to see if medicine therapy is suitable for them. Point seven, immunotherapy toxicity or side effects are important to recognize. Early recognition and prompt treatment is important. We know immunotherapy works by activating the immune system, and sometimes the immune system gets overactivated and attacks other organs. In principle, any organ can be implicated. It's important to let your cancer nurse or doctor know as soon as possible if you experience any side effects or feel different. The most common organs that are involved are the skin, the thyroid, bowel, and the liver. The likelihood of certain rare or permanent side effects such as immunotherapy-driven diabetes or nerve damage is less than 1%. Now, clinical trials provide a great opportunity for patients and people to access new treatments and up-and-coming treatments that would not be available otherwise. They are run to the highest standard and undergo rigorous approval process to ensure that patient safety and patient well being is always the number one priority. The control arm um, is not always placebo, and it usually reflects the current best standard of treatment. So the trials are looking at better or doing better than the current best. We at MIA have an incredible clinical trials team that support patients with uh, melanoma treatment. Now, Melanoma Institute Australia's uh, website provides a fantastic and valuable array of patient resources. This link will be made available to you and this information on diagnoses, treatment, patient information, patient support and clinical research that's going on. 
Lastly, melanoma care is disciplinary, multidisciplinary. It's about a team of people working together to ensure that our patients get the very best care. Doctors, nurses, trials team, administrative staff, staff from our biobank, research scientists, all contributing their expertise and skills for the sole purpose, excellent patient care. So to finish off, we've come a long way, but we also have a long way to go. I'm gonna share a quote with you, uh, which is close to my heart. It's from the late astronaut Kalpana Chavla, who died in the space shuttle Columbia disaster when the space, uh, spacecraft disintegrated in its, on its re-entry to Earth. And she said, the path from dreams to success does exist. May you have the vision to see it, the courage to get onto it, and the perseverance to follow it. And on that note, I invite you to join MIA's and MPA's effort and vision for zero deaths from melanoma. Check out our website on how you can get involved because every effort counts. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Grover. What a critical um, clinical update and how far we've come in a very short space of time and such exciting um, new clinical trials and new information coming through um, all the time. Um, really appreciate that incredible update for our patients. We've had heaps of great questions coming in, but we are gonna hold those over until the Q&A panel at the end. Um, but your talk has certainly um, triggered lots of interest from, from our audience tonight. So we look forward to tackling thank those questions. And I'll take 10 seconds to thank the entire MIA team for supporting me through this, and especially Professor Georgina Long and Associate Professor Alex Menzies. I really appreciate all their support. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Grover. We'll move to our next speaker now um, and invite Karen Van Gorp, who's our patient uh, speaker, to share her a video with us and um, give a wonderful presentation. So a very warm welcome, Karen. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and I can have, I could go straight on to my first slide, no, my next slide, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And I just wanna say, um, uh, I'm speaking to you tonight from um, Ghana country um, in the Adelaide Plains. And I'd like to pay my respect to the people whose lands I come from this evening and their leaders, past, present and emerging, and recognise any Ghana people out there in the audience today. I am the mother of three boys living in Adelaide with my very supportive husband. We have local holidays and extravagant birthdays. And you'll see a bit of a theme here. I work for the South Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the Policy and Advocacy branch at the moment. That's an incredibly busy job with new, um, two new um, federal and state um, uh, governments. I grew up in the Northern Territory with blistering sunburns and no tan, the wrong skin in the wrong country. I started having BCCs, basal cell carcinomas and precancerous skin bits burned, frozen and scraped off in my mid-20s. I was at high risk of the more deadly melanoma skin cancer, but I was never told this. It almost killed me. But I've also been very lucky. So last busy with three boys who in December 2011 were three, eight and ten. So looking at my back when I was driving myself after I'd stepped out of the shower was a fluke. I noticed a small black ugly mole shoulder blade and at a doctor's appointment for something else I mentioned it and my doctor said oh, let's cut it out and see. The pathology report came back, stage 1A invasive malignant melanoma, but the excision was appeared narrowly complete, according to the report, and it took four more tries to get it all. But on my fourth excision in February 2012, we found tear margins. Next slide, thank you. A year later, I noticed an odd lump under my right arm which I thought might be related to the damage I'd done on, to my shoulder in a rather spectacular horse riding accident that I'd had a few months prior. 
But finally, I made an appointment. I left my four-year-old with a friend and caught up with my new GP, who sent me straight off for an ultrasound, like, then. She phoned and organised it, and off I drove. Oh, and then a fine needle biopsy once I got there. So the 21st of February 2013 was my middle son's 10th birthday. My oldest boy had just started in a new school. I was trying to hold it together. My new GP had had tears in her eyes and her hand shook as she reached out to hold mine to tell me the results. Metastatic malignant melanoma. My husband and I decided not to say anything to anyone until after my son's party that weekend. Now remember the date. 2013. So if we um, if we take notice of the the um, reports from the last from the last speaker, ten years ago there was a ten percent chance of surviving melanoma. So my my GP had very good reason to look upset. Next slide, thank you. I was plunged into a new world with its own language and rules. I was quickly sent off for surgery, complete removal of the lymph nodes under my right arm and lymphedema for life. Feeling like a poor cousin, I was so lucky to be able to get support in and after hospital from breast cancer nurses because this surgery happened to be in the same place as, as um, breast cancer patients get as well. So was the radiotherapy that followed, the mop up radiotherapy. I noticed we haven't had any mention of radiotherapy. Oh, thank goodness. They and my surgeon knew lymphedema was just down the end of the road for me. Not every hospital or every cancer has this level of support and it was vital to my mental health and my survival. I was able to start treatment for lymphedema early and stay on top of it. And I've spoken with many people who are not provided with advice like this or not able to afford the mainly private treatment and have longed for the day when we don't have to have this surgery, stage three melanoma. So if you actually look at both the Melanoma Patients Australia and MIA website, they both have very good information about lymphedema, but I look forward to the day when we don't have to have this surgery. And it is on the horizon. Thank you for, for giving us that hope. Surgery and radiotherapy was all there really was for stage three melanoma back then. No one ever tells you enough about radiotherapy, how similar it is to being hit by a train or your skin will burn and slow off. And the only other possible treatment was interferon, which had, not, had no clinical evidence supporting its use. In the meantime, I just had a scan, found a lump, lump under my left arm. And it appears that while I was distracted by drains, infections and radiation burns, the cancer had spread to my lungs and liver, as well as a lump under my left arm. And by June 2013, I was diagnosed with stage four. And I had either a five or 10% chance of survival. July the 13th was my youngest boy's fifth birthday. And he was about to start school. And I remember waiting for everyone to be out of the classroom, trying to tell his new teacher what was happening in case something came up at school. And I couldn't get my words out through my sobs. She was absolutely brilliant. I needed to make sure that he had somebody there who knew what was happening and could support him if anything came up. I signed up for palliative care, but I kept searching and hoping. My melanoma didn't have the BRAF mutation, which would get me on the targeted drug trial, but that first drug trial, that sounds like I missed a bullet, dodged a bullet on that anyway. I missed accessing another trial because our strategy wasn't good. I'd been given chemo in the meantime, and the newest drug, which had absolutely no effect, and the newest drug wasn't on the PBS yet, pharmaceutical benefits scheme. I didn't understand what was happening. There wasn't a strategy. So I took things into my own hands. Was in the lungs? Okay, I need to exercise. I need to keep my lungs at capacity. I need to be as healthy as I possibly can be. So I ate green and completely non-processed food, and I green juice. I also saw a naturopath. I accepted prayers and good wishes from all denominations and I wore my crystal every day. But I Googled because what else can you do at four o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep for panic attacks? I was desperate. I discovered an article 
financial magazine about a pharma company who had a new drug trial and it was boosting their shares. I found the article published in the New England Journal of Medicine in July 2013 about a phase one trial. I called the pharmaceutical company and asked when and where are the next trials for this drug. They told me the trials were in Melbourne or Perth, but they wouldn't be open for a couple of months and I really needed to talk to my oncologist. My new oncologist had read the article, and yes, he'd refer me. I called every week, sometimes more often, but the trial didn't open until mid-October. I had a wonderful group of new and old friends who had opened their arms to my family and invited us to join them on their annual camping trip. It occurs around the October long weekend in South Australia, and many of my oldest two boys' friends were in this group. While we're on this holiday, I remember calling every day during that time to ask if the trial had opened. I was in pain. And my oncologist, my new oncologist, was very worried, but insisted. I insisted I wanted this drug. It had a long and complicated name, took me ages to practice it, and of course it ended in MAB. It was a phase three arm trial. The drug Phase three, three arm trials, sorry, there were two threes there. And the drug I wanted was on two arms. Pretty good odds, I thought, two out of three. My family and friends weren't that sure. And they sent a friend with me to Melbourne to pick up the pieces when I didn't get the arm that I wanted. But by that stage, fate had no chance. I had decided. I got the high dose arm of the trial, celebrated with the first glass of bubbles I'd had in months. I started on the 15th of October. October the 23rd was my eldest boy's 13th birthday. Everyone doubted it, but my fingers were crossed that I would see his 14th. By November the 24th, anniversary, it was my birthday. I could feel the tumours under my skin shrinking and I was pain-free with very few side effects. One month. On the 2nd of December, my husband's birthday, I felt so well, I shared my secret with him. Christmas came and went. We were celebrating every event as if it was our last. This was a trial. We didn't know what was happening. But the scans in January showed a 67% reduction in tumour size all over my body. I was so lucky. Other than the rash, which is good to get, we and we tell that to all our immunotherapy newbies, I had a bit of a cough, um, some BCC inflammation, which was really interesting, fatigue, joint ache, and looking back several years later, brain fog. But because it was a trial, I struggled with these side effects, not knowing just getting old um, or whether I should report them. So I'm a compliant patient, I did, sometimes only to get a sceptical look. Um, which was a shame because it's vitally important to report any possible side effects. And if it becomes serious, it's important to be near your own, to be your own advocate or to get a second opinion. Immunotherapy is still in its infancy and it's so exciting. There are a wide range of side effects that are becoming evident and melanoma has been the first child. But now other cancers are also reaping the benefits and should also be aware Learn the lessons that it took us a little bit longer to learn about side effects. I flew to Melbourne every second week for two years. Um, I was very lucky. Um, clinical trial, this clinical trial wasn't available in Adelaide and a lot of people wouldn't have been able to afford to go to Melbourne. So I really am so looking forward to platforms where regional and out of Sydney and Melbourne patients access new clinical trials because as has just been said there this these these immunotherapy drugs still only really work for 50 percent of people with the help of friends who rostered to take me to the airport every second week one who paid for a hire car to pick me up when i came home and people who occasionally took me out out to lunch on the way um I've, I've been incredibly lucky and our communities are amazing. But I'd advise people to accept graciously what's offered as they really want to help. I started returning to work. My new num, 
normal started to set in. I popped my head up, looked around. I was the only survivor of my support group. And this, more than anything, has been the reason for my consumer advocacy. I left the trial. It was wonderful. I was so supported. I knew exactly what was happening to my body every fortnight. Um, I left the the trial feeling that I was falling off a cliff. I had no survivorship support or survivorship plan, and everyone needs this ongoing support. And it doesn't have to be from a doctor or nurse. We need to use our trained peer supporters and consumer organisations to make most of our workforce. I have, with the support of my employer, been able to return to work live a full life looking after my children, paying taxes. I was able to support my mother through her last days and I can support others through my advocacy. But this isn't the case for everyone. Immunotherapy and survivorship are still in their infancy and we live in hope that more and more people will be able to survive and thrive going into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Karen, on behalf of everyone uh, for sharing your incredible story. And the wonderful thing about your story is it's a story of hope for patients affected by advanced melanoma and also a story of the importance of access to clinical trials. So it's absolutely wonderful that you could share that story this evening with us. I'd like to now welcome back um, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Grover, and our guest Q&A Panelist, Professor Georgina Long AO, welcome to the QA panel. <laughs> Dr. Grover, are you there? Fantastic. Great. We're all here. Now we've had a lot of great questions coming through throughout um, the various um, uh, talks. Um, so I might start with um, a medical focused um, question first. And we are aware of women in the MPA community who've received conflicting information about the advisability of becoming pregnant after immunotherapy. Some have been told they're not to conceive uh, yet become pregnant. Others after discussion with their team did become pregnant. Is there any evidence relating to pregnancy uh, after immunotherapy for melanoma and what guidance should women receive on this topic? I'm not sure whether Dr. Grover or Professor Long would like to take this. I might take this one. Uh, This comes up a lot, um, particularly in the adjuvant setting. So when we treat uh, melanoma earlier, so stage two and stage three, as Dr. Grover nicely sort of summarized those stages, Um, So um, there is not a lot of evidence about uh, whether it's safe to get pregnant having had immunotherapy. We have to think of this in two ways. We have to think of females uh, who would like to get pregnant. We also have to think of males who would like to father a child after immunotherapy. We have a few what we call case reports of spontaneous pregnancies after immunotherapy, and there is no evidence to suggest Uh, that there is an impact on uh, the fetus, the baby. So there have been some healthy children born after immunotherapy. There is one issue that can occur during immunotherapy. You may uh, develop thyroid, um, hyper, then hypo, so low thyroid. Sometimes your pituitary can stop working, and these are important hormone glands in your body. And they um, manage the whole rhythm of your your, uh, morning, nighttime, wake cycle, but also it relates to your sexual hormones. So you're um, important for sperm and eggs, et cetera. So your your, um, cycle, female cycle. So sometimes that can become abnormal and you may need some assistance from an endocrinologist, but you should still be able to get pregnant. Now, what do we uh, advise patients? When I see patients who are young and would like to start a family or are thinking about starting a family, we discuss fertility preservation before treatment if we have time. Uh, We definitely discuss it, but whether they have time to go and have fertility treatment. So we advise young men to uh, put away some sperm store some sperm and young women to either uh, put away some eggs or 
uh, if they're in a relationship, sometimes embryos, depending on where they are in their life situation. So that's what we discuss with the patients, but there is no firm evidence that immunotherapy negatively impacts your ability to get pregnant or impact the fetus. Um, but your hormones can be disrupted. And so sometimes it may be more difficult to fall, uh, to fall pregnant. Generally though, take home message, think of this before your therapy and uh, have some fertility preservation if you have time for, for that. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that important information, Professor Long. Okay, we've got lots of questions about the actual um, immunotherapy and targeted therapies. Um, we've got one asking, do patients on targeted therapy also get adverse events um, I, to the same level as those seen in immunotherapy? I think the question is about, is targeted therapy kinder than immunotherapy in terms of its side effect profile and um, adverse events? Sure, I'll take that one. So targeted therapy and immunotherapy are different therapies and they work differently. And the way they work, they cause different side effects. Now, with immunotherapy, the side effects that we tend to see are immune side effects, where the immune system is overactivated and may attack the good parts of the body. The targeted therapy is actually targeting that mutation that occurs in the melanoma cells in the DNA of melanoma, but it can also cause side effects. The vast majority, more than 95% of side effects with tablet or targeted therapy are reversible. The ones that we tend to see most commonly are things like fever or nausea or chills. And there's some one side effect, which is very rare, which is a permanent, which can affect the blood vessels of the eye, but that's a very rare side effect, but they're caused very differently. Um, some people breathe through tablet treatment and some people find it a little bit more challenging. And similarly with immunotherapy, some people breathe through immunotherapy and some people find it a little bit more challenging on the body. And that reflects the diversity that occurs and the different responses that can occur. Uh, so very different mechanisms or the way these side effects are caused. The key take-home message is that with tablet or targeted therapy, vast majority of side effects are reversible. So once we stop those tablets, the side effects go away. With immunotherapy, there are some side effects that may be permanent or life-changing. Thankfully, some of those are rare, but things like thyroid side effects, uh, which may the thyroid may be under or overactive, that can occur in about, say, 10% of people. And that means that someone may need to take some thyroid supplementation um, for as a permanent sort of measure. And most people tolerate that really well, but it's a case by case. Keeping on the topic of side effects, there is another question here. Is it true that the more side effects a patient has, the better they are responding to the treatment? That's a fantastic question. Uh, and it's, it's a matter of a lot of research. Uh, the answer to that is maybe, yes, but not always. Um, so I think I've covered all of those <laughs> options that may exist. So there's certain things that we see, which we know are associated with a good response to immunotherapy. One of them being vitiligo, which is when we see the loss of pigmentation of the skin, or some people say, oh, my my hair is getting fairer or my eyebrows are getting fairer. We know that people who develop this side effect do very well or better on immunotherapy. And the earlier trials demonstrated that. And I was uh, very junior at the time, but I, I hear from Professor Long and Associate Professor Menzies in their clinics that it was, you know, as we discovered, that was a very intriguing finding at the time. We also have evidence that people who develop thyroid uh, disruptions early on may also be an early sign that the immunotherapy is working. However, on the other side, if one does not develop side effects, that does not mean that immunotherapy is not working. So I think there's, it's, 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 there's a lot of sort of nuances and lots of aspects to consider. And in medicine, we always say there's, there's hardly anything that's sort of black and white, and it's um, on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So, and I think we got to recognize um, that to, to, to take each person as an individual and look at them sort of as a, as a complete picture to see if the treatment is working or not. And just on that, I want to highlight a really important concept, which often comes up in the clinic. It's that if I develop a side effect and if I have to stop treatment, this must not be necessarily good. Yeah. And I want to, I want to talk about that for a minute, if I may. Now, every treatment, every treatment, and I can say that as even as a pharmacist, has benefits and every treatment has side effects. Every medicine. Yeah. Even water, you say, would have benefits. If you take too much water, it's not good. Now, it boils down to having more benefits than side effects for any treatment for any person at any given time. And that equation changes over time for each person. What we don't want to do or, you know, is developing a side effect. And we know that once the side effects is developed, we know the immune system is engaged. And sometimes, this is important, sometimes even one cycle of immunotherapy is enough to cause a response even one cycle. And in the adjuvant setting, in the mop-up setting, we say, you know, up to a year. That 12 months is arbitrary in some ways. For some people, even a little course of immunotherapy is sufficient to actively engage the immune system to result in a durable response. And we need to, at every point of the journey, make sure that we are balancing the benefits of the treatment versus the side effects. Great. And um, uh, we've got a couple of questions from the, the, the two separate questions from different patients who are who are really concerned about stopping treatment. So they've been on the treatment for quite a long time. Um, one of the patients has been NED for five years, is still on TAFMEC. And then we've got somebody else who's on immunotherapy, I think. And um, they're, uh, they're, they're basically saying they're scared to finish the treatment in case, you know, the melanoma is going to come back. Um, they're wanting to know are there, you know, what are the guidelines? What what are the things to consider? And are there adverse effects of staying on the treatments in the long term? Yeah, fantastic. It's, a, it's again a great question and a matter of a lot of research as to the duration of treatment. We are largely driven by what the clinical trials did, uh, and that determines our, our practice. So we are driven by evidence based uh, practice based on data that has been generated through clinical trials. It depends on what therapy it was. So if we're talking about immunotherapy, we tend to see durability of response or the, the longevity of the response where it works. So in my one of the first few graphs that I one of the early graphs I showed, what we see after some time was the flattening of those curves, which means that once immunotherapy works, we see that response being maintained over a long period of time. So at that time, the risk benefit ratio changes for some person. It doesn't mean that immunotherapy cannot be used, but this is an important discussion to have. And it's totally understandable that, you know, these drugs for a lot of times have been one's lifeline in some ways. And you, you wanna hold on to that as much. And we need to support and have a discussion with each person as to what their sort of situation is to come up with a plan that is particularly tailored for that person. With right. targeted therapy, however, uh, we are actually trying to investigate as to what is the right time. Um, and, I, with, and because we know targeted therapy works differently to immunotherapy, but we, we've had a lot of people and we're currently looking at as to what might be the right time, when to stop targeted therapy. And can we do that safely without compromising on the cancer control? Great, thank you. This one's for you, Professor Long. Um, the question is, what is ahead for immunotherapy? What's, what's in the future and what happens if there is a recurrence sometime after finishing treatment, uh, after a complete response, especially for stage four? Uh, great question. So I'll answer the second question first. If a patient has a complete response after immunotherapy, they tend to do very well. That is what all our data is showing. Um, in fact, very few patients with a complete response uh, will recur from their melanoma 
to put some data around that, if someone has a complete response and gets to three years uh, from the time they started their treatment, um, the chance of the melanoma coming back is about five in 100. If you get to five years, it's about one in 100. So if we take 100 people who've had a complete response at five years, only one will have the melanoma come back over the following couple of years. So it's very, very rare. The good news is we generally treat for two years. There are three reasons we stop early. One, if there's a toxicity, as Dr. Grover explained, um, number two, that, that limits our ability to give more therapy and it's dangerous. It's really about being dangerous. We've got to remember that immunotherapies work by switching on the immune system. They don't kill the cancer directly. So once you've switched it on, if you've switched it on a bit too much and you're getting damage in normal tissues, you can only do more damage by giving too much immunotherapy. We've done the work. We've switched it on. It's it's. It's holding the melanoma, in fact, uh, killing the melanoma. So um, two years is usually what we treat for. Three reasons we stop. Toxicity, patient choice. You know, an older patient who uh, might be in their 80s, even 90s, who doesn't want to come in every three or four weeks and have had a good 12 months of treatment with an excellent response, you may choose to stop and watch in that case. Um, toxicity, or if it's not working. So uh, it's very rare for it to come back after a complete response, although it can happen. What can you do after that? Many options. We always take it on its merits at that time. You can re-challenge with immunotherapy, the same immunotherapy. It works in over 60 to 70% of people. You could put a patient or consider a clinical trial. Often, though, we can just treat with surgery or radiotherapy because in that setting, we find often not always patients will only have a recurrence in one small area. Uh, and so we can and use surgery or radiotherapy in some of those cases. But everybody is different, as Dr. Grover emphasized, and every melanoma situation we take on its own merits and try and find the right treatment for that person. What's ahead for immunotherapies? We've still got a lot more work to do. I think as both uh, Piyush and Karen have highlighted, we're only getting to about 50%. So uh, clinical trials, as um, Piyush also highlighted at the end of his talk, are key. We have a lot of exciting clinical trials that we're working on. We have to remember they're very experimental. Um, so they may not lead to great results, but they are a hope. But we are also collecting tissue, and I'm always inspired at uh, how, how much uh, Australian patients are willing to be so altruistic and allow us to do biopsies on some of these novel treatment, treatments so that we can understand response and resistance and come up with the next best therapy. So there's a lot of different things we're doing with immunotherapies, not just checkpoint inhibitors, other things to enhance the immune system, vaccinations, the mRNA, COVID, Believe it or not, those two companies, the, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna, those two in particular, uh, they came from a company called BioNTech and Moderna. We were working with them long before COVID. They actually got the mRNA uh, technology started in cancer and then switched gears when COVID came along. And it was such a success story. Um, but watch this space with what happens with that sort of technology in cancer. It's very exciting. So there's a lot of different things happening. That's only one small part of it. It may not be the be all and end all. I just want to warn people about that, but we are working, working at it. Fantastic. Um, the next question, I think um, both Karen and perhaps um, one of our wonderful clinicians might be able to respond to, but patients are concerned about getting finding clinical trial. You know, how, how do I find a clinical trial? And Karen, it sounds from your talk like it was a lot of hard work, a lot of self-advocacy. Have you got any advice for patients? I think um, for me, uh, the clinical trials work, but I, I just learned about them. Um, and and so it was hard work. Um, I unfortunately I didn't at the beginning feel that I that I could that I felt like I needed to take control. That might also be my personality. I'm a little bit that way. Um, but really, if 
you can go to the source, which is often um, the American um, clinicaltrials.gov, but I know that there are other organisations. I know MIA has its own clinical trials registry, and there are other organisations throughout Australia that also do it. Probably find an oncologist who you can work with, who is a specialist in melanoma, because they are more likely to know what the clinical trials are that are available. Who, and I know that the melanoma clinical um, community talk to each other a lot. I, uh, there was a, a wonderful person that I was that I supported. My her um, her oncologist and Georgina um, were able to to talk together and come up with something, even though that patient was in Adelaide. So um, there is conversation as well. So I suppose your first step would be making sure that your oncologist is a specialist in melanoma. That would be my first step. Thank you. And I can see, um, Danielle, thank you for posting in the chat the link to the MIA current clinical trials link. Um, Professor Long, have you got anything to add? Yeah, that was great, Karen. In fact, you, it's perfect advice. Um, speak to your oncologist and ask about clinical trials, um, number one. Number two, though, uh, the uh, there are lots of lists of clinical trials. However, the source of good quality clinical trials will be the what we call the NCT or the American um, uh, online uh, 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 clinical trials website. Uh, all the trials are there. They are searchable. And on that, you can see where they are around the world. Being on a clinical trial is a very tight umbilical cord to the centre, as Karen nicely uh, pointed out. Um, and travelling far for a clinical trial has to be very seriously considered um, because especially with stage four melanoma, when you may have symptoms and fatigue, et cetera, I think that's a big, big issue. But there is a the, the source for all trials, all great trials that are listed would be the um, website, and I can put it in the chat or if Danielle, if you were able to as well, NCT, but I'll, I'll do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I, I want to do a round robin around our wonderful panel with the same question. So we had a question, what would be the single best piece of advice you would give to a patient recently starting systemic treatment? <laughs> so putting you guys on the spot here, but is there sort of a single piece of advice, you know, your best piece of advice that you'd give somebody who's just, you know, starting out on the journey and starting yeah. on either targeted or immunotherapy? <laughs> I don't know whether we should start with Karen because she's done it herself, but I've got, I've got something that I, I like to say to people, particularly with stage four advanced melanoma, but um, hearing from a person who's done it themselves would be very interesting. Karen, what would you say? You're on mute. You're on mute, Karen. The, the, the Zoom problem. Um, I would probably um, go, my go-to, especially for immunotherapy, uh, because I haven't had targeted drug uh, therapy, um, is to stay as healthy as you possibly can. Um, we know that there are some studies that show that your gut biome, a good gut biome, um, may help with the response to immunotherapy. There's um, there's a lot of work being done in that. And really that's avoiding antibiotics, avoiding probiotics, really eating fresh um, vegetables that give you the prebiotics. Um, exercise, there's a lot of evidence about exercise supporting people and helping people. It's really setting your body up to do the best it possibly can. So if you do have side effects, you've got a healthier body to deal with it. If you do progress for a bit longer before you get a response, you've got a healthier body to deal with that. Uh, well, Georgina, I'm just hanging out to hear what yours is now. Oh, oh Piyush has heard me say this. I'm curious to hear what Piyush has to say as well, given his um, year with us and, and watching both uh, Alex and I and seeing a lot of our new patients first, actually. Um, I'll, I'll go first and see whether this sits with you, Piyush, uh, and whether what else you would say. But one thing I find is it is very nerve wracking for people sitting in that seat the first time they meet their medical oncologist. I'm talking here particularly uh, any patient who's about to have drug therapy. But for someone with advanced melanoma, it is 
it is still historically was considered and still is a terminal condition. Um, and uh, hope is important, but the first three months are just a whirlwind um, roller coaster ride. And what I like to say to people is try and forewarn them about that emotional state because forewarning for arms, we are not going to be able to take away that anxiety. We can't, but we can try and help you manage it a little better by being forewarned. It is going to be a roller coaster. You're not going to know whether you're going to respond. You're not going to know whether you're going to get one of those side effects we've just spent a lot of time detailing. Uh, you're not going to know a lot of things. And so it's a time, a period of time where things are up in the air. Be prepared for that. You will cry. You'll be happy. You'll be anxious. You will experience a whole gamut of very strong emotions. But as long as you're forewarned, you're just better able to handle it. And believe us, when you get to the three months, that is a time where things start to make sense. You've been in a rhythm. Uh, you get a scan result. It may not be great. It may be good. But then things become calmer. No matter what, which way it goes, it does become easier to manage that uh, roller coaster ride of emotions and anxiety and concern. Uh, the other thing is ask your oncologist about uh, psycho oncology support. It is normal that this situation is a lot of pressure for you and the family, and you may find some tools helpful for that level of anxiety because the anxiety is there. Everyone knows it will be there. It's just managing it, trying to sort of not forget it, but deal with that, that circuit. So that's what I say at the very beginning of treatment for someone with advanced melanoma. Great advice. Thanks, Professor Long. And how about you, Dr. Grover? Thank you. I, I, I'd completely echo with Karen and Professor Long. Um, I'll have 10 commandments for that, but in the interest of time, I'll only stick to three. Um, but the first one might would be to find your tribe. And I think it's important to find the people that support you and encourage you. Um, and they're different people at different stages. And that also, so that's the first thing. Secondly, engage with your GP. And ironically, I think I've learned all these things from our patients. Um, so I think the GP can still be a fantastic resource. And we always try to make sure that we communicate regularly with the GP to what's going on. And the GP can provide some fanta fantastic um, support within the community. Uh, thirdly, I think make your nurse, uh, your C we have our CNC, which are clinical nurse consultants. These are specialist melanoma nurses that work very closely with patients. Make them your friend. They are, they are fantastic. And they will be the ones that supporting you if there is a side effect or something. And it's important to have a good relationship and knowing their details and when to be able to call them and seek that help. And that's fantastic to bring you know, that aspects of cancer care together. Wonderful. Um, we've had so many amazing questions and I haven't managed to get to all of them, but we um, we are already um, out of time. In fact, we've run over a little bit, so I couldn't I didn't want to stop the um, amazing answers. But um, look, we did have some other questions and I would encourage anyone who's um, watching to have a look on the MIA and MPI website questions around uh, particularly um, how you make decisions on whether to um, uh, put somebody on immunotherapy versus targeted therapy. Uh, and also some questions about, you know, um, can I, um, if something hasn't worked, can I move, you know, what are the rules about what treatments I can get to, but there's a, a whole raft of great information on our websites around that. And I would uh, strongly recommend you speak to your oncologist if you've got those specific questions about your personal treatment um, uh, concerns. So on that note, I would just like to say huge thank you to our amazing panel, to um, our, our patient speaker, Karen Van Gorp, to Professor uh, Long and, and Dr. Grover. Um, you've given us the most incredible information this evening on behalf of everyone at Melanoma Patients Australia and the Melanoma Institute Australia. I'd like to, um, to thank everyone for sharing their ex expertise and the topics. Uh, tonight is one that's a hot topic for all of our patients and families. Uh, we're often asked for this information and I think having it in this uh, wonderful webinar um, format will, uh, will be there for the future as well. 
I'd like to remind everyone as well, there is support available. Uh, Dr. Grover, you talked about finding your tribe and um, just want to remind everyone that we do have a support line um, at MPA, a telehealth nurse service and support groups around the country that people can connect into if they're facing a diagnosis of advanced melanoma. Uh, more details can be found at our website, which is melanomapatients.org.au. We hope to share this webinar recording out with everyone who's attended in coming days. So please look out on our social media and on, our, on both of our organisation's websites. Our next webinar will be next Thursday night, um, the final in our three part series, and it's on approaches in detecting melanoma and living well beyond a melanoma diagnosis. It's really important we get your feedback. You will be given a little survey at the end of the session tonight. We'd love it if you took a few minutes to let us know um, what you thought and how we can improve for, for next time. And um, on behalf of all of our panel, all of our speakers and both MPA and MIA, I'd like to say very um, big thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.